This is uh, the Business of Jazz Seminar Part 1, utilizing career resources. And let me say we have folks up here who are, I know, going to be great help, have good questions. This is, we hope, a very practical, op an opportunity for practical answers. Uh, when you leave here today, hope you have a plan. You know, okay, I know what I'm going to do next and continue on your road toward uh, success in the jazz field. I will start to my left and introduce the panelists. Uh, Regina Carter is a professional musician, a violinist who has studied both classical and pop and jazz. She is from Detroit, Michigan and got her start there in uh, playing with a symphony orchestra, playing in a pop group, and was one of the founding members of a, a jazz string quintet called Straight Ahead. She is now a solo artist with two CDs, two albums <coughs> under her belt, so to speak, and can certainly speak uh, about her experience as a working artist and what it takes to do the business of jazz. To my immediate left is Ms. Cheryl Goodman. She is executive director of Arts 2 in Baltimore, Maryland. And Arts 2 provides arts administration, management, services, that's fundraising, programming, marketing, representation to individual artists and nonprofit organizations. She has worked, uh, provided these services for the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Maryland Council for Dance, for uh, BET, Black Entertainment Television. She has also been the convention director for the annual Jazz Times convention. So she's very experienced <laughs> in dealing with part of the management of, of arts. To my immediate right is Jill Maxie Schreibman, who is a delightful person. <laughs> and she's also with the community relations director for uh, a company that is on the leading edge of music technology in 2K slash Jazz Central Station. And in case you are not on the internet yet, Jill Maxey can tell you all about that. She grew up in Manhattan on Long Island. She went to Binghamton University with a BA in philosophy. <laughs> so uh, she's played trumpet from third grade. I don't know if she still plays trumpet. She can tell us about that. She was once a uh, radio, a jazz radio disc jockey. She lives still in New York. She's got two cats. She's written for a, uh, a jazz publication and she loves music. But uh, we are looking forward to hearing about how the internet, computers, etc., can help move jazz into the 21st century. And our final panelist is Michelle Taylor. She is president of NIA Entertainment. A management organization and she does manage well-known jazz artists. She has been in the music business. She's been at uh, music labels, Verve, Atlantic. Uh, she was the, uh, as Jill Maxey put it, the, um, well she was the first site director for Jazz Central Station which is the the internet jazz source and uh, she had the vision for what we see when we go online to get information about jazz around the country and around the world. I would like to start by asking each of the panelists to kind of give a brief uh, statement or about what you see as the biggest challenge facing artists, managers, whatever perspective you'd like to take uh, right now, what what is the biggest challenge that we face in the world of jazz as we try to market and get ourselves out there and get the music out there? Regina Carter, please. Um, the biggest challenge is just getting the work, first of all, and um, I, I think a lot of times in in certain arenas, uh, um, presenters sometimes have a habit of maybe hiring the same people over and over. They know these are safe artists that are going to draw and a lot of times they may not be willing to take a chance <clears throat> on newer or lesser known artists. Um, and I think it's difficult if you don't have a CD out or if you don't have, if you're not with a major label because a lot of these presenters are counting on support from the label for ticket buyouts, uh, tour support, maybe for the record company to pay for travel or hotel, 
So that's a major thing. If you don't have that, I think it's, it's, it, it tends to be uh, difficult. Um, so I think you almost have to look at the CD as a, uh, as a business card or, or entryway in, which is very difficult because it puts a lot of pressure on you to, to feel like you always have to have the CD in order to, to get out. But I think um, maybe artists can uh, start at a very grassroots level and say, okay, if I can book this many gigs wherever, like in a certain area, the Midwest, or we're going to do the South, or we're going to do this, this area. Um, and maybe the gigs won't pay that much money if you're a newer artist, but maybe rent, if you have a van, you own a van or rent a van, instead of flying, and you just have a group of musicians that will work with you and are willing to do this trek in a van from place to place to place. And then if you don't have major support behind you, if you've put out your own CD, um, you take those CDs with you and you sell them. And I know that, uh, I believe that Hootie and the Blowfish, that was one group that started out like that. They just were traveling around everywhere in a van selling the CDs that they had. And then record companies start to track, they see how you're selling, that you're selling major records without a label behind you, without any support. And a lot of times that attracts them because if you can sell that on your own, then with, with a little bit of help there or push they're going to put, you can really sell a lot more. And that's basically what record companies are looking at numbers. Um, and you, I think as an artist, we have to, so just start at the grassroots level and get a band together that's willing to travel with you like that and sell your own CDs. It's a way to do it. And to have someone help you, I think um, you don't need when you're a new artist, you don't really need a manager because that's someone taking 15% of your income and basically you aren't, you aren't making any money anyway. So somebody's going to take 15% of, of what? So I think if you, you know, no. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle. <laughs> I'm making two cents now, so I get you. <laughs> but uh, I think if you can find someone that's willing to help you, a friend. When Straight Ahead first started out, we had a friend of ours that was really interested in helping us out. And she worked at a museum, and she was very good with um, or, or, organizational skills. So she became like our booking agent. She would make phone calls for us. But the thing is, is we never left it all up to her a lot. We were making a lot of the phone calls, and we'd come together and meet all during the week. And we'd make our own press packages and get this out. But a lot of the times, we'd let her handle the phone calls and we would pay her whatever we could pay her and she appreciated it and it was fun for her to learn about the business so it's just some of the ways you know when you're when you're first starting out and I know I should shut up now right? <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl Goodman from the standpoint of a presenter from uh, with grants and nonprofit organizations yeah actually I was gonna say that I agreed with what Regina was saying but to expand on it a little bit it's I find the biggest challenge is actually everyone's perception of jazz and Regina sort of talked about it from the artist but I think I mean from the uh, presenter at first uh, in how they're willing to make their booking decisions but I find that everyone's perception has to be affected in order for jazz to move forward the audience's perspective on what jazz is um, I know when I first started my my introduction to jazz was what my parents listened to which tended to be a lot of uh, jazz organ for example and so that was my only definition of what jazz was Unfortunately, I didn't particularly care for that. So I went through life saying, oh, I hate jazz. You know, I don't want to hear that. And not until I got into a certain point when people started to introduce different forms of jazz to me and I realized, oh, well, I still don't particularly like organ, but I like these other things that, you know, then I was more interested in listening to jazz and going to live performances and things like that. So the audience has to expand its perception of what jazz is. Um, the presenters have to expand their idea of it and what their audiences are willing to listen to. And, and there are a lot of presenters who, who have audiences that really, again, don't necessarily care specifically what jazz artists they hear. They just want to hear good jazz music. And those kind of presenters sometimes are very willing to book emerging artists because their, their decisions are not based on how much money this artist is going to pull in. The audience, is, and the Baltimore Museum of Art is a good example of that. They do a summer series. And the audience that goes there are members of the museum. They go to the museum because they enjoy what the museum has to offer. They may not necessarily know who the artists are that are going to perform, but they know that whoever the museum brings is going to be good. They'll be surrounded in a safe and beautiful environment. 
they get dinner, you know. I mean, everything is just nice. So they're willing to support it on that end, and they learn about jazz in the process. So there are different perceptions, I think, that we have to affect. What I'd like to see the artists do a little bit more is I come more from a nonprofit side of it, having worked with a lot of funding organizations and art service organizations where there are a variety of resources that are available to artists, and either they don't know anything about them or they don't take the time to find out. You know, blunt, you know, basically to say that there's free money available, there is. There, there are grant funds, there are monies to help artists uh, do commissions uh, with organizations. There are all kinds of uh, technical support. Even if you don't have a manager, there are some grants you can get that will specifically pay for you to hire someone to fundraise for you or do your marketing for a year or be your manager for a year. And as I worked at these organizations, I would find so few particularly jazz artists who ever take advantage of that. So I would just like to see everyone's perception of what jazz is change a little bit, expand and open up, and uh, really sort of reap the benefits that are out there for them. Thank you, Cheryl. Joe Maxey, challenges right now. Right now. What do you have against Jimmy Smith? <laughs> see, I didn't say that specifically. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm getting used to it. One of my favorite New York fantasies is uh, I just wish one day I would go to Rockefeller Center and. Jimmy Smith will be playing the organ at the rink. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to go with what's been said before. I think, I think a lo the, the first challenge is almost an internal one. And I, I have this experience a lot. What I actually do is, um, I don't know, if, have, uh, anyone's familiar with bulletin boards from being online, but basically it's like if you think of a community, think of like the coffee shop, the laundromat, the church, you know, there's places where there's bulletin boards and people put up, you know, room for rent, you know, whatever. You know, I have cats to give away. This is the same thing except it's online. And um, what winds up happening is, is you make friends there. And a lot of those friends that I make at Jazz Central Station are musicians who are sort of at different levels. Some are professionals. I mean, Dee Dee Jackson is there all the time, uh, you know, who are touring and have, uh, you know, sort of a professional life. And others are just starting out. And they always, the, the challenge for me is to assure them that there's no quick fix, that a record deal isn't the only answer. And I always challenge them to ask themselves what it is that they want. What does it mean to make it in jazz? For some, it means, you know, like Regina being, you know, you know, being out there and, and touring and sort of being in the middle of, of everything. But for others, it will mean teaching or it will mean um, working with other artists. Or there's so many, to me, making it in jazz is so... I feel like I'm making it in jazz. I mean, and I sit in front of a computer all day. I haven't picked up my trumpet in years. But so anyway, that's one of the biggest challenges is sort of encouraging musicians to really always ask themselves what it is that's true about, like, what, what is the truth of their art? What does it really have to be? And um, that's, I'd say, the biggest one. Because everybody is so focused on that record deal mm -hmm. and that's not to say a record deal isn't a sweet thing. It can be, but it doesn't. I mean, I've seen artists get that record deal, and and nobody promoted that record. And, uh -huh. and you know, they had gigs, and and nobody, you know, the publicist didn't do their job. And it, it's not to blame. It's just a fact. You know, record companies are businesses with a vision of their own, and it's not always in line with your vision. And that's why to sit at home or be with other people and talk about your vision is so important because at least you have your vision and you bring that wherever you go. And that's the biggest challenge. And the internet is a huge arena to um, develop a vision because of all of the community and like what you're saying about grassroots. I mean, grassroots is supposedly something about the, you know, just is the people. And it's, it horrifies me when I hear them talking about it in marketing meetings because, you know, that's, I don't know what that means there, but. It, uh, you know, to me, it means talking to regular people and, and, you know, talking to young musicians and people who may not wind up with a record contract but are who, but who are going to be doing jazz in their life and passing, you know, participating in a jazz lifestyle. So 
I feel that the biggest challenge is sort of staying close to your vi to that vision and being always, uh, you know, not, trying not to compromise it or or being open to changing it if that's if that that's what involved. And so I would say the obsession with getting a record deal can be a very damaging thing to a young musician mm -hmm. because as they go into the to the studio they've saved up all their money and they're going to cut their CD and you know now that that the CD technology is so inexpensive relatively you know everyone can cut a CD and you know it, it becomes instead of enjoying the music and instead of it being <coughs> about what it was in the beginning when you started playing um, you know, well, you know, people are like, well, you know, will the marketing people like it? What, what do you think the hook is? Gonna, you know, it's this kind of, you know, in, in craziness. And uh, I think the biggest challenge is really just keeping it really clean and staying, staying focused on the on the on the music. Thanks, and Michelle Taylor. Um, I'm just going to take from what everyone has said. Coming from a label background. I've done jazz at record labels uh, since 1987, 85. And um, I've seen it change. I've seen it get better. I've seen it get worse. Um, it's probably at its worst right now as far as jazz at record labels because we're living in a culture of, of popular music. And jazz has never been a popular music. Well, it's been popular back in the days when the 30s and 40s when people used to dance to jazz when jazz was the popular music, but of late, jazz is not the popular music and record companies are about popular music. They want a quick hit. They want to make their, their contribution. They want you as the artist to make your contribution to the bottom line now, not having a record like a Duke Ellington record that was recorded in the 30s but is still selling tremendously today in 1998. They don't care about the longevity. They want the quick hit now. So in saying, in, with Jill saying that um, record contracts, um, getting a record deal can be, well, I should say is a big part of the problem because artists strive for that, they get that, and then they're not supported. And once you're dropped from a label, unfortunately, especially if you've gotten a contract with a major label, that's looked at as, oh, you know, they were dropped from blah, blah. And not necessarily that that will hinder you from getting another deal, but that will always be with you. Well, you know, so-and-so dropped them, blah, blah, blah. I've seen it all. I mean, I ran the jazz division at Atlantic Records. Um, prior to beginning my company, I was the uh, division head of Atlantic Jazz. And Atlantic was built on African-American music, R&B and jazz. And now, this day, which is why I'm no longer there, it's been relegated to the lowest denominator. They don't support it. They have fabulous artists. One was Regina Carter. And this woman is so extremely talented. And they, were, they didn't know what they had. You know? And you're right. You go out on tour as an artist. You work so hard to get the record deal. And you get the deal. And then they say, well, you need to be working. Well, OK, so help me get work. They don't, they don't do that. So their excuse to the artist is, well, we can't support your tour because you don't have a tour. You know, We can't support you on the road because there are not enough dates for us to put together monies to give you. So the artist goes in, tries to do what they can to, to promote the date or the venue. Um, what ends up happening is the venue won't bring the artist back because they didn't get support. So venues want butts in seats. If you don't get the support to promote the show, you're not going to have butts in seats. You're not going to be invited to come back to the venue. That's a problem. So record companies are a big challenge right now. And my, um, although I wouldn't do it, I recommend uh, anyone, any aspiring artist, to not put such a big deal on the record deal. Make your own recording. Go, you know. There are so many. You can go into a studio for a little studio, someone's house, make a record, get it pressed, do it on a DAT, get it pressed onto a CD, and like Regina said, sell those puppies out of your car. When you go to a, uh, when you have a show, let folks know, okay, I'm going to come into your venue. Can I sell my CD? And most venues will allow you to. Some will ask for a commission. 
but that's a good way. And as Regina was saying, you start selling a lot of those records, that's going to make labels perk up. Oh, they're selling. I hear this buzz about this artist, Regina Carter. She's selling a lot of records in Chicago and Detroit. We need to keep an eye on her. You know, then they're more apt to, if they give you the record deal, they're more apt to support you coming in because you've already created a buzz, as they say, or a groundswell. But I would recommend to anyone, you know, don't put such emphasis on the record deal because you can make a fabulous living touring, uh, doing your own records, um, teaching. There are so many other ways for a, 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 an artist to, to make a living. And, and again, if, if uh, record labels are not signing you, start your own record label. Why not? You know, get a, you know, you want, that's how Ahmed Erdogan did it when he founded Atlantic Records. He had an office, one room with a desk. In the evenings, they pushed the desk off to the side and they recorded. They recorded music that they loved. They recorded music, was, it was their hobby. Who knew that Atlantic Records would be Atlantic Records of today? They just, they were recording black music. This is what they love to do. So why can't any of us, why can't we start our own label and rival some of the majors that are out here today? That's one of the challenges. Also from a management perspective, now working with clients on this side of the table, well one of the advantages to my being a manager I think is because I know the label system so well. I've done it for so many years. So there's nothing that a record label can tell me that I don't already know. So don't let tell me you don't, can't do this because blah, blah. <laughs> because I'll say, well, yeah, I understand that. But if you do it this way, then perhaps we can, you, we can find a happy medium somewhere. So I mean, there's really not a whole lot that a label can tell me. Um, but I'm, what I'm finding as a manager now and, and, and working to secure opportunities, performance opportunities for my clients um, and, and, and working with booking agents, uh, budgets have shrunk tremendously. Budgets, everybody's budgets are being cut from nonprofit to, you know, major festivals. Everybody's budgets have, have shrunk and they don't have as much money to pay a lot of artists. So as Regina mentioned, they want the sure bet. They're going to bring artists in that they know are going to put butts in the seats. They don't have the luxury anymore of having the kind of money that they can just put out to take a chance. On a, on a young artist. And it's wonderful that those arts organizations like the museum still have the room to bring in an unknown artist or bring in a local artist. I think that's so important because, again, these major festivals want the sure bets. And, and in a lot of instances, the only way that, that an artist is going to be out there recognized is if they're given these opportunities. But, you know, my challenge is, well, how do you know that Regina's not going to work for your festival? Why don't you give her, you know, I see you have these artists on your festival this year. Well, you just had those three of the five last year. So let's bring in some new artists. You know, that's what I find are some of the challenges as a manager, just talking with people about the monies available and talking with people about creative ways to expose some of these newer artists. You know, instead of going for the sure bet, you could possibly have just as many butts in the seats if you are creative in your marketing and promotion. That's a whole nother thing. So if your budget was cut for the artist, well, and you still have your marketing promotion budget, okay, maybe we'll take a little less money, but market the heck out of the show so that the, the artist is going to have butts in their seats and they'll be given the opportunity to perhaps come back another year. So those are just some of the challenges that, that I think we face. In, in the jazz arena. I mean, everything that, that we've all said is so important. Um, as we go into the new millennium, we have to think about how we go. I think it's, it's, it's you know, everyone says, oh, jazz is coming back. Well, jazz never left. <laughs> Where did it go? It never left. You know, it's just we have to be creative and we have to, to stop putting such emphasis on the record deal. And the, I mean, yes, it is nice. But you can make a fabulous living without a, a record. I'd like to say a few words also from the uh, <clears throat> radio station perspective. Um, well, <laughs> if you are not from Washington and you live in a market where there is a jazz station, you're blessed. <laughs> right. uh, unfortunately, jazz is a great big umbrella 
but unfortunately radio programmers in the commercial end of the business have decided to label jazz a certain way and currently uh, there's only one sort of jazz that gets played consistently on a commercial kind of radio on, on commercial radio and that's what they labeled smooth jazz which for uh, many people is offensive <laughs> uh, actually and and I, I guess it is in my conversations with people because so often you will hear people that would never call themselves jazz artists being played when there are so many commer right. uh, commercial jazz people who could be played I mean if you're going to go that way at least play jazz artists and not Luther but that's you know <laughs> that's not our conversation uh, so if you are an unknown acoustic player, you're probably going to find yourself on nonprofit public radio. And uh, the, the I'm from public radio now, so I, I think it's wonderful, but the downside will be that you're going to fight that uphill battle for listenership. Public radio has a smaller listenership for exposure and this kind of thing. Whether even when you produce your own CD, and I'll, I'll get to that, you, you, you're going, you've got to find ways, either find that friend as straight ahead and Regina did, or, or just split yourself into a kind of two personality person who can get rid of your, uh, your, your own feelings about your work and be your own bet promoter. So when you hear no, it doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't hurt your feelings. And then you've got to call them. You've got to send that CD. You've got to find cute ways to make somebody listen to it. It is in, very inexpensive to cut a CD. And in most major places, certainly around here, uh, you can get into a studio and do it. I see a young up-and-coming artist who's sitting here in the audience who may stand up and talk and give you her budget. <laughs> But it doesn't really have to cost that much. Right. If you get it, then try to get yourself booked. And as everybody suggested, bring your CD with you and put it out there for people to purchase. But find a way to get somebody to play it for you. And then find a way to get that person to interview you on the air. Because the other thing this will do is help you get that kind of practice you need for presenting yourself well. I, I know for artists, it may um, make uh, artists may often feel a little reticent about being a self-promoter. Get over it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, just and, and if you are a manager or you plan to work with other artists, help them get over it. That hey, we are do not live back in the times when uh, uh, monarchs gave out money to artists to paint the Sistine Chapel or to play or to compose these pieces. Those days are gone. Even though, although I guess they're nonprofits who do, sorry, but, but, but even in, in that, if we, if we can send everybody out here into the nonprofit world to get grants, you still have to find ways to stand out. And I think if you believe in your art, that's the first calling card, obviously, and the most important. But you still are going to ha need to find ways to make the people that you deal with remember you and want to deal with you again. And so that, you know, self-promotion. And I have major, I do three hours a day in, in, on a public radio station, and I will, I'll hear from record companies, jazz companies, who will say, uh, so-and-so's coming into Blues Alley, will you talk to them? And, and you know, these are major, well-established players who I'll say, sure. And then that person calls me at home, and then I call that person back. You understand, this is not, especially in the jazz world, these artists are the ones that do the work for themselves most often. Uh, it, and so. At any experience you get in self-promotion, in telling your story, in learning how to put your passion across both in your work and in the way you describe what you do can be all to the good. Okay, you want to respond and yeah. then I want to get some questions specifically from folks who may have this. Okay, I'll, I'll do it quickly, but a concern, I want to sort of go back to what Jill said about the biggest challenge being your personal decision, your personal vision. And I think that affects everything else that we're talking about. Once you decide personally, what it is, how it is you want your career to be, then it helps you make decisions about all these other things. Do I want the record contract, record, the recording contract? Do I want to make my living primarily through live performance? Do I want to tour nationally? Do I want to stay local? Once you make those decisions, that determines then all these other uh, strategies that you'll use. 
whether it's in dealing with uh, radio or not. And like I said, my issue is usually the resources that exist that people um, ignore. And on your chairs, I, I typed up a little list of different uh, nonprofit organizations that provide anything from funding to, mm -hmm. to technical assistance and any mm -hmm. of that. And when I say, and although we're not living in a time when people are just giving out money, you know, I'd like to think of it that we are. You just have to know how to go and get it. Mm -hmm. And if you live in Washington, D.C., or you live in uh, Maryland, or you live in any state in this union, there is a state art agency that exists that provides grants, that provides what they call fellowships, where they just give you a lump sum of money because you are excellent at what you do. It's that simple. You know, now, depending on where you are, it depends on how many people apply you know, for that. But these fellowships can range from $3,000 to $5,000. The application process, you fill out your name, your address, you make a tape, you send it in. You know, it really doesn't get any easier than that, okay? And they will pick 10 or 15 people that year to give $5,000. And you can use it to pay your rent or your gas and electric while you pursue your artistic career. Now, to me, that is somebody giving out free money. Sure. And if you have your plan in place, then you use that money to do whatever it is you want to do. Like I said, there's a grant in New York where if you're a jazz artist and you need an instrument, you can get a loan from the New York State Arts Council. The, the interest rate is like 2%, and you have up to 10 years to pay it back. You know, where else? You know, I'm not even, well, I'm going to tell you about what kind of loans I need for things, and, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not playing anything, so I don't get to use that. So I consider that free money, you know, relatively. But these are the kinds of resources that exist that, we're not paying attention to. And they work in tandem with what Michelle was saying. If you were trying to get booked at a certain location and they're concerned that, well, no one really knows your name, you won't bring in the money, and you're asking for, you know, $5,000 as your fee. And you say, well, if you call this organization, they have a grant that will give you $2,500 towards my fee. You'd be surprised how many okay. venues will say, oh, what's your name again? You know, and they will call. I Usually when I do booking, I have the application in front of me. I say, I will fax it to you, and I fill out their name on it so they know what, who the, what they need to do to then book the artist that I'm talking about. And when you make it that easy for someone, that's not illegal, by the way, so don't think, you know. You can do that. Send, you know, I'll get the grant application, send it to the organization. So there are ways to make these, um, these resources work with the, I call it making the nonprofit side work with the commercial side. And all of it, if you have your plan in place, which should be in place because your vision is set, then you can move forward. But when your career is just sort of, oh, I want to do this, and oh, well, so-and-so's doing that, so I want to be as good as he is, and, and he's getting that much money, so I should get that. That's not what should determine what your action is. You have to make your decision and sort of grow from there. Another challenge also is just with this information that Cheryl has imparted thus far, who knows? There are so many artists and aspiring professional musicians that don't know about that, those grants and those loans. Mm -hmm. It's like, how do we get that information? That's where I guess the internet comes in, mm -hmm. you know. But then there are a lot of people that are not still on not it. on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we it, hope mm -hmm. not that many. But <laughs> there are still a lot of people that are not on the internet. So uh, another challenge is, is being able to get that kind of information mm -hmm. because it's so important, mm -hmm. you know, to myself even managers. You know, where I have clients that perhaps might be helped by some of the grants or, or loans or opportunities that are available, you know, and there's a lot of information that I don't even have yeah, as even, a manager. Yeah, even international booking, I'll tell this one last story and then I'll, I'll get off of it. But um, when I did work for one of the funding organizations, uh, there was a uh, group out of South America that wanted to start touring some jazz, or emerging jazz artists. So they contacted a nonprofit group uh, in the Midwest and that organization contacted the nonprofit that I worked for. So they just wanted some suggestions of emerging artists. They said, well, can you tell us like three people that might be interested in touring in South America? <laughs> yeah, <Three>. right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you know. So OK, I give them a couple of names. That was four years ago. And one of the groups that I suggested just returned from their third tour in South America. Um, the tour now is a 15, I think it's a 15 city tour that has gone from South America to Europe. Now, that just happens, I don't know if that happens all the time, but that was solely just some connections made from one nonprofit entity to another with a suggestion, you know, can you give us a suggestion or recommendation of someone? 
And then for year after year after year, this uh, festival, this tour has continued. So these people have been able to benefit. It was the first time that they were able to go uh, on an international, to tour their group internationally. So that's then helped them do some other things. Mm -hmm. But that all came out of just being connected to a nonprofit organization in the first place. Just letting the state art agency or this regional arts organization know that you exist as an artist. Right. And if you don't take your career seriously enough or take the time to look into what is out there to help me so I don't always have to start at square one, I don't always have to reinvent the wheel, then a lot of opportunities are really gonna, going to just pass you by. I went to the East Coast Jazz Festival this, this year, and one of the major things I, contributions they make is they really bring youth into the process. They build it in. They had workshops, special workshops in the morning for the, the School Without Walls with uh, Buster Williams. They had high school jazz bands playing all day long in the atrium. They, had, um, they were building the audience, because if we do not build the audience with the youth, then there won't be an audience, because most of the people attending the festival were over the age of 50. I mean, I could really say that. And also, I think it's really important to make sure that, I think like, for example, the Kennedy Center's resources, I'm sure, are stretched very thin, but they could have brought high schools here. You know, I mean, we could have filled up this place more with youth. I mean, really, it has to become a, like a sort of a priority. My question to you is, can you talk about some of these sites and um, how, where you find them? I've gone in and I've clicked on countries under music, entertainment, music, jazz, countries, and you can get the jazz list for every club and every festival happening in Europe or anywhere else. But I mean, I don't know what you're talking about specifically about your. Some of the sites, the jazz sites that I know of besides Jazz Central Station are Jazz Online, mm -hmm. Jazz Corner. There's a, there's a new little site uh, called Bird Lives. <laughs> our friend. Uh, our, yes. Um, so those are jazz sites. And I think there's another one called All About. There's something else also, Jazz Central. Um, there's a Jazz Central station, but there's also a Jazz Central. Mm. So if you don't finish typing it, you might wind up at Jazz Central. Uh, but those are some of the sites. And um, if you don't remember those, uh, do a search. Do a search. And, and actually, search engines are because it used to be that the search engine was a glorified like a kind of a living phone book, you know, you would just kind of say, it was like, it would, they were sort of like what, uh, you know, when you call for information, ideally what that, the information giver would be like. If you didn't know the name of the person, you could kind of give them an idea. Well, could you kind of look up this subject? And it's like that, it's like a librarian crossed with a phone book or something. So now, the search engines, some of which are Excite, Yahoo, um, Alta Vista, Magellan, um, right, um, and there's right there's a, there's some there's a number of them. It, it is likely that if your computer uh, came with you know if you have Netscape or Internet Explorer, which are the two big browsers that are being used by most um, manufacturers, there's usually there's going to be a button that says search, and it will sort of be you know it'll bring up a couple of different searches. Put in the word jazz. Put in the word bebop, put in the word swing, any of those words, any word you can think of, violin, fiddle, uh, whatever, names of artists. And what happens is that the, the search engine sort of goes through every little tiny word, every little, what in, in, H, in code, in HTML, it's, they're called tags. And uh, people load up their site. And this is, this is actually, if any of you are planning on making your own website, there are some search engines which you can't trick anymore, but people in computers are very tricky. And they have found ways to sort of trick the engines to come to their site. And what they do, it's called met, they're called meta tags. And when you look, when you look at, the, at the coding, this, uh, you can't see it. But like, for instance, the first page of Jazz Central Station, I don't know if it's still like that, but it's full of words that you don't even see, but they're there so that the search engine, when you type in the word, you know, my mother, it goes, it, it finds it. <laughs> you know, like, like the word swing, 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 bebop, bebop, jazz, you know, rhythm, blues, it, it, just any word that's a, that you think that a person would think of to type in will, will draw it to your site. So you don't have to remember the names of the sites that I just said, just like no jazz and type those words in and just be relentless with your curiosity. And, and what, what is returned are, are lists that have lists that the engine has made 
of sites that contain those words. So the first one you get will be the list, the, the site that has the most occurrences of that word. And sometimes they're, they're, they're not just sites produced by, you know, official, you know, makers of jazz sites, but they're people. They're just like people like you and me who make like a Jimmy Smith site or some other fan site, kids in school. You know, those are the people who really have, you know, have grown up with computers. They just, you know, like some 11-year-old boy just want a, a suit, uh, it, his, his uh, URL was pokey.org. And the Art Clokey, the, the guy who was the creator of Gumby, you know, Gumby and Pokey, there was this whole battle. But he's a little guy. When he was born, his dad bought him the domain name of pokey.org. So it's, it's the kids. They all, have, they all have personal websites about jazz artists. <laughs> That's it. You just plug in the names, and, and you'll find stuff. And just, you know, there's also going to be a learning curve. So you'll know, you'll start to get which sites are worth your time, which aren't, and, and that's it. But I mean, finding sites like hers. Oh, like hers. Well, like, OK. The word, the word arts. Well, I would think about words like arts funding, mm -hmm. um, money for arts. You could also um, go to, let's see, what would we do? I don't but I, you know, many nonprofits are probably best reached through phones, and I think Cheryl's idea to call your state agencies. Yeah, yeah one. I mean, there are certain ones like uh, there's a funding organization, Meet the Composer, that has its own website, and you can download the applications uh, right from there. And they have uh, right, the right. But again, uh, the list I gave you sort of lists out. Um, I tried to do it where, um, if you think of it as. Uh, as far as government is concerned, you have the National Endowment for the Arts. Mm -hmm. Then you have each state has a has an organization, and then a lot of cities have their own organizations. So you have uh, the national, the state, the local, and then you have regions. So if you sort of start at the national, they can tell you everybody else. You know what I mean? Because everybody is sort of smaller and is getting money from them <laughs> in some way. But um, but generally speaking, if you do call your state art agency, is probably closer to you, where you'll probably actually access a, per, a real person, and don't get stuck on a voicemail that'll have you giving your address, you know, 15 times or something like that. But I would say call probably to call your state art agency. I listed the ones that are on the East Coast that I thought most people in this room would probably uh, the states that they would live in. You call the state that state art agency that you live in, okay? Um, and uh, basically from there they can give you probably the, a good amount of information to get you started. There's another one on, um, it's on Fifth Avenue. It's like called the Grants Library or the, the, foundation, the foundation Center. Foundation Center. Right. Yeah, there's one of those, and there's one here in, New, in, in where am I, in DC. Right. Uh, and a lot of cities have them, but they're connected to, your, to the library. Mm -hmm. uh, New York and I think DC have separate uh, buildings uh, where for the Foundation Center. But for example, in Baltimore, it's a part of the, net, of the, the main library. A uh, question here? Oh, yep. OK, Dr. Taylor. <laughs> uh, I'd like to follow up on something that Regina said, uh, because I think it's apropos to everybody in the room. Uh, speaking from the uh, um, side of the artist, she gave us uh, how to, uh, one way to access uh, um, an audience it's really about getting jobs, I think, for most people, being heard, getting whatever it is you have to say music, uh, musically out there. So uh, she gave us a couple of starting points. Uh, could you add uh, something to that from the manager's standpoint, from the uh, computer standpoint, and also uh, from the, as you were doing, from the uh, um, uh, not-for-profit standpoint? Because I think uh, what I got from what she said, it's about flexibility. You've got to do all of that. It's not one, it's not either or. It's, it's a bit of everything, whatever works for you as an individual. Mm -hmm. Did, am I yeah. misquoting you? Mm -hmm. no, that's... Being involved in your community, knowing what's going on uh, in your community is, is very important insofar as getting a start. You know, a lot of uh, communities have, again, arts organizations and, and even jazz societies. There are opportunities through churches Regina's actually done quite a few um, concerts uh, just through friends of hers at their churches. You know, you, you should find out, you know, what your church organizations are doing. Even uh, schools, high schools, the universities in your area, what they're doing from a, a um, 
performance standpoint, these are all grassroots things. F knowing what kinds of um, uh, uh, performance opportunities are happening, smaller performance opportunities. You know, perhaps the library is having a festival that you become aware of. Well, even if you have to donate your services, I got into the business by working for free. You know, I wanted to get into the music business so badly, and going the traditional route of sending out the resume and knocking on the doors wasn't working for me. So I volunteered at WBGO, a radio station in New Jersey. Everybody wants free help. So if you are a solo artist, all the better. But if you have a band that, that you're working with, a lot of times it's, you know, everybody wants to get paid for their work. But if, you're, if, you, if you have a, a, a tight band and you know you guys are working together, to get yourselves out there. There may be a couple of those opportunities that you have to take that where you won't get paid. And it's all for the, 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 you, the, long, the long plan. You know, you say, okay, well, we're, I'm not gonna be able to pay you now, but I'm hopefully, and you'll be surprised who might be in that audience that will see you and then say, you know what, I do this, this arts festival in the summer and I'd like you to come down and teach or I'd like you to come down and present your band. There are all kinds of, no gig is too small. No gig is too small. You never know who might be in that audience that will then, uh, uh, you know. So I would, I would recommend knowing what's going on with your libraries, with your arts organizations, with your churches. With, just get involved in your community. Music teachers, if, you, if, you, if you're in a community where there's a, a school that has a music program, Find out who the music professor, the music teacher is. They may have some ideas for you as far as uh, 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 performance opportunities. Um, teaching, you know, um, there are so many ways to, uh, the radio station, if you have a, if you're in a market where there's a radio station that, that uh, uh, plays jazz, find out who the jock is. Find out who the programmer of the station is. Find out if there's anything that you might be able to do with that station. You know, they may have uh, an, a, a, a fair of some kind, a record fair or a, I don't know, whatever kind of fair where they might need talent. I mean, there are so many ways to, to, to get yourself out there. And, and you shouldn't uh, start out by thinking about the big bucks because it's not going to happen. You know, and, and working for free is not necessarily a bad thing when you're just getting started. Because even as a manager now, there might be opportunities that I look at for my clients. And I represent Regina and Antonio Hart, Tommy Flanagan, uh, Louis Nash. I mean, I represent artists that are working and doing their thing, fortunately for them. Um, they're very talented. But there are times when I look at a gig that may not pay them what they're used to making. But it's such a wonderful opportunity. You know, it's, such a, it's, a, it's a different venue, or, or they'll be in front of a different audience where I'll say to them, well, you know, you're not going to make as much money as you normally do, but this is what's going to happen as a result of. You're going to be performing in front of all of these school children, or you're going to be performing in front of, you know, there, there are, there are um, senior citizens' homes that are coming together, and you have an opportunity to share your art with them. Or there are there are other things that it's not always about the money, and 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 there are many artists that do things where they're not paid just for the sheer joy of doing what they do and sharing what they do with other people, and and there are so many ways to do that just starting out. I'll piggyback on that to say that one of the things that I, in my experience talking to artists, every time an artist gets to play is a learning experience. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so any opportunity most artists get to play, they forget to ask whether they get paid sometimes, sometimes. Uh, especially for emerging artists, that's probably, but for those of us that don't play but want to support, I make a plea for people to come together and create as many jazz societies as possible. Mm -hmm. um, because these are, this is another way for lovers of the music to support emerging artists or the Tommy Flanagans of the world who don't get booked like we may think he ought to get booked. So that by doing that, you proselytize, you get out there, you tell other members of your community. Uh, I, uh, I'm just thinking, most places, uh, Tacoma Park just 
two years ago started a jazz festival. Uh, we're trying to get one going just up the road in Silver Spring, et cetera. So lots of small communities have ongoing uh, uh, jazz festivals that you probably don't get paid, but sometimes you do. Uh, I also know in Prince George's, the Na Maryland National Cal Capital Park and Planning Commission get, hands out lots of money. It may not be big money, but Regina, I know, has come to perform uh, at the public play, I mean, at the um, John Addison Concert Hall. And, uh, you know, they are able to bring in major artists, but are also interested in developing artists locally. It needs the advocates also, the people who love it, who say, oh, I can help fill the house or bring enough people in to make sure. So while we have all this wonderful talent and we want our children to know that there are things you can hear, that there are musicians who study and practice and learn. And as an example of what can be done, it's very important for people who want to support it, who want this music to be here also, to find creative ways to show that support, to let presenters know they'll be there, to, to say we want to hear these people, to, to buy the tickets to the paid events so that uh, people know that, that, that they can rebook again and again. Uh, let me say something though about about playing for free that kind of thing i'm sort of split on that i mean i, I agree with you that um that no gig is too small but i think that what you have to do too is look at the opportunity if someone invites you to play for free you have to look at number one who it is that asked you to do that who the organization is and if you notice that the budget that they have they paid a whole lot of other people and they're having a reception and the, the biggest caterer in town is doing it, and then you are playing, and you're not getting anything, then you need to stop back and say, wait a minute. I think you also need to let the, the venue know, well, my fee is normally $2,000. However, you know, I really believe in what you're doing, and I can discount it this much, or I can do this for free because. Or make sure, like you said, um, I have a CD, and I'd like to still be able to sell my CD at your event. Some kind of way you can get something out of it. You should always have in your contract, and you should always have a contract, that says, I want this amount of, this number of tickets, free tickets, for my performance. So then, if you're going to be performing there for free, you can make sure you invite some other presenters who live in the area, or some nightclub owners who live in the area, who can come out and see you, so it can lead to something else. But don't just go into it like, oh, you know, thank you, you know, for right. letting me right. uh, be in here. <laughs> I had a, a, someone call me just recently, and the more I thought about it, the more the angrier I got. And this is actually for a dance event. But they were opening a new fitness center, and they wanted to have aerobic groups and dance groups come and perform. Now, the event is in two weeks, and they're asking me to book. They're calling me as a professional person who has my own business to call up a dance company of 15 people to come out and do this event for free for their, for their opening. And they said, oh, well, they exp and this is before I asked them how much. They said, oh, the exposure they're going to get, which meant this is going to be free. So <laughs> as I'm talking, he says, well, we have, we're doing a mailing of 25,000 pieces. I said, oh, well, I better get you a photo quickly so you can, and, oh, well, the, the piece has already been designed. It's at the printer. So I'm saying, well, wait a minute. What kind of exposure is this right. group getting? Right. Well, we want them to dance for 20 minutes. It's going to take <laughs> them longer than 20 minutes to get to your place to do this, to get the 15 people together. You know, that is not a good event for that group to do. And I think you have to look at it and say, how do I really benefit from this? And even if the venue doesn't think of how you can benefit, you should be thinking of how you can benefit. So you just come up with, you know, let, let me figure how, how I can make some money from this, and then OK. But don't let, and also, and I think it also affects people's view of what jazz is when they think they can always get it for free. Because believe me, if you do it for free and the next person does it for free, the next time someone comes in and asks for $3,000, yeah. oh, we didn't pay the last two groups that came in here. You know, so you don't want to really keep setting that up. So some kind of way, you can do free things, but it doesn't have to really be free. You Value know? your services, yeah. and then take it off your income tax as a, as a contribution. Or even right. if you get, you know, if you don't get a, a paid dollar, you might ask them for their mailing list. Right. Where something. you might yeah. want to send a flyer or a, or, or a newsletter or something about what you're doing in the area. That's another way of getting paid right. at yeah. the beginning. Find out if they're videotaping it or taking photographs, right. and then you get a copy of the videotape right. and, and some photographs. You'd be surprised how many jazz artists come up and they don't have a, a good photo to use in their press kit. Or you know, with a lot of these grants, sometimes you do need a, a videotape. And if you, they don't have one, you know, or they have one that they did in their garage that looks like, you know, come on. So there's a certain level of professionalism you have to maintain. And you have to look 
at it for yourself because the other people are not going to be looking, not going to be taking care of that for you unless you have hired someone to do that. I think one thing that uh, uh, has come through loud and clear is the willingness of people to uh, do something for themselves. And I think that uh, based on what I've heard so far, one of the uh, important additions that most people can add uh, uh, to what they're doing are the educational uh, uh, things that are possible. They not only uh, create other work, but they're specific in uh, reaching specific audiences. Uh, a lecture demonstration, for instance, can be for an older group, a school group, uh, a group in, in uh, uh, some uh, cultural center. Uh, the idea of making, uh, of looking for and making uh, available libraries and, and uh, venues which are not normally associated with jazz. Uh, jazz is not necessarily, uh, people have a misconception about where jazz was born. Jazz was not born in nightclubs or in the, in the uh, red light district of New Orleans. That was a place that people could get a gig. So a lot of people worked there, but it was born prior to getting there. And so that doesn't, uh, the, uh, the mystique of playing in, in uh, uh, nightclubs has been way overdone. As you can see from the reception uh, of people at the, the Millennium Stage, the people on in another venue from what we normally have at the Kennedy Center, a larger venue, uh, all of this uh, merely adds to the desirability of, of listening to, to someone. So it's not the venue. I mean, you can, you can, you can make these ven venues work for yourself. Uh, but if you think of, for instance, uh, a clinic is something that you would do with a large group of people. You'd say, this, you know, this is the way you do certain things, this is the way I do certain things, or I suggest you do certain things in the music. That's a clinic. A master class is when Regina uh, uh, comes and, and oversees some violinists and says, this is the way you hold the bow, you're doing something that uh, you can do this a little better, you can, you, uh, and she gives them, from, as from, a, from a master's point of view, some things that are gonna help them play that instrument better or understand music better. So if we define uh, the kinds of things that we do as individual, I think it, it'll, it'll open the, the doors to other kinds of gigs other than merely playing, but they will, lay, they, they will uh, be uh, uh, an addition to the possibilities of you actually doing what you want to do as, as a performer and or a writer. We could go, well, we will go on tomorrow at 10 o'clock <laughs> with part two of the business of jazz. Thank you all for coming. I hope you're inspired. We're going to... Uh...